Welcome to the podcast about investing in startups, where existing investors can learn how to get the best deal possible. And those that have never before invested in startups can learn the keys to success from the venture experts. Your host is Nick Moran, and this is The Full Ratchet. Welcome to another release of Investor Stories. On this installment, the experts talk about their investment philosophy, how they evaluate early stage startups, and how that may be unique from other venture investors. Here is the segment called Venture Investor Strategy. On today's special segment, we have Andrew Parker of Spark Capital. Andrew, can you talk about your thesis and also how you evaluate early stage startups for investment and maybe mention aspects of your approach that might be unique from other venture investors? I think above all else, uh, I care about you know product, product quality, interviewing users. I was academically trained in human computer interaction and, and the biggest component of, of that training involved doing a lot of user testing. And you know, sitting in a listening lab behind a glass mirror, or you know, sitting next to a given person, you know, in like a Starbucks or something like that, you buy them a cup of coffee and you you get their feedback on you know whatever prototype you've been working on or something like that. And I I think that that experience, both academically and then also in the real world, when I was doing product design, product management for this company Homestead. Uh, you know, the, the combination of the experience that I got there translates really well to VC and and to be fairly product oriented when it comes to making an investment. I, I work a, a little bit earlier than some of my colleagues at Spark. Spark's wheelhouse, I would say, uh, from an investment thesis perspective is, is Series A. We like to be the first institutional investor in a company. We do seed stage investing for sure. It's just not a majority of what we do. I think the, the check that we most commonly write as the first check is is a Series A check, whereas for the deals that I've led on behalf of Spark, the majority is seed. And so because of that, I think you know, product quality at the early stages really matters. And then it's also the team, you know, just talking to people that I'm really excited about working with and could envision working with over the course of the next five to seven years. That's, that's really what you're committing to. Any big insights on either customer adoption or engagement with products that you learned at, at Homestead when you're doing VOC? It's funny, you know, it's ancient history at this point. I do <laughs> think that the, the qualitative side of what I learned about how customers engage with a product does translate, you know, meaning if, I, if I'm just talking to one user and interviewing them, I, I do think I honed some of my ability to do that while operating at Homestead. But, you know, this was back in 2005. And so, like, our product iteration phase was probably, you know, 14 to 20 times longer than what the average startup is today because we would push code to our website roughly every two weeks. And like, you know, now with uh, continuous deployment or, you know, uh, a lot of the far more uh, agile means by which you can uh, build your product, most of the companies I work with are pushing code like every day. Uh, maybe not the app companies because they have the gatekeeper of Apple and the approval process there, but but certainly the, the web-based ones can push product every day. And so, I don't know that my skill set in, in product design translates um, to that modern phenomenon at all. <laughs> <laughs> On today's special segment, we have Mark Suster of Upfront Ventures. Mark, can you tell us a quick story about how you arrived at your current investment thesis and how it has evolved to now? Yeah, I guess if my thesis is driven by back in the most talented entrepreneurs I can, building tech businesses that want to disrupt incumbents, um, part of that was my own journey, my own mistakes. My first company, I went and sold really expensive products at high prices to big players because I knew how to do that. I knew how to get multi-million dollar contracts. So I hired a bunch of expensive staff. And then I raised too much capital and Raising capital means you have to constantly hit your quarterly revenue targets. Uh, so it forced me into irrational behavior because I wanted to feed the beast of the expectations that I had set. And then I watched low-cost incumbents take storm. I mean, the first one was I was living in London when Skype took off. Skype took off in Europe well before it did in the U.S. 
And I saw that they had this freemium model that people were just using it. And by the time the big corporates were trying to clamp down on Skype saying, it's not secure enough and I don't want you to make Skype calls and whatever, it had already become too big. You couldn't shut it down. So I started realizing that it was a smarter approach if I could build low cost products. And if you didn't hire a bunch of expensive people and if you kept your cost base down and, and built market share fast, um, and that only truly talented people could do that. So, you know, I think it was really my own journey and my own mistake. So when I set up my second company, you know, we kind of said, what would Skype do? You know, uh, WWSD. And, uh, you know, this is in the early days of Skype. It informed our product decisions because we were saying, how do we offer something super cheap that spreads across organizations that eventually I can go to, you know, chief security officers, or I could go to finance people or group managers of IT and say, sure, we could put these groups in so that you could uh, create a more secure environment. Um, but now you got to pay for the paid version. You know, so I think like that mentality of company one versus company two really set out my journey. On today's special segment, we have Samil Shaw of the Haystack Fund. Samil, can you talk about your thesis and evaluation process and maybe mention aspects of your approach that are unique from other investors? Yeah, my um, this is the, I'm excited because this is the, really maybe the second time in all the funds that I've had where I've had a very, very clear focus, sector focus, and what I want to look at. Um, and that just you kind of go in waves of being in the groove or being out of the groove as an investor. So now it's a good time. So a third of what I do is consumer. So there's three types of consumer things I'm looking for. Uh, VR-related technology, not applications, but technology. General consumer stuff where you're getting into the credit card spend of a household. And then very specific in terms of consumer spend around intercepting healthcare costs. This is just such a huge component of the economy. So people who can figure out ways to siphon off some of that money I'm interested in. Second category would just be SaaS, you know, straight bread and butter VC SaaS, except that I look for two things. Uh, either A, they have to create a new category so that there's no other company doing what they do, and or they have to bring some type of machine intelligence to the offering that's vertically integrated into their company, not that they've built on somebody else's platform. And then the third area, which is kind of a quirkier area, a third of my fund will be industrial software and industrial IoT. So this could be 3D printing software, drone data or software, augmented, you know, industrial AR, uh, augmented reality products. And then it, the main types are usually distributed sensor networks that help large industry collect and analyze data. So those are the three areas that I look for investments in in this current fund. Now, that could change in fund four. What do I think I do that's unique? Um, I don't know. Usually when I get that question from LPs too, I ask them to ask the founders. I don't know. I think probably more people read what I write, which I'm very lucky for, so that people feel like they know me in some regard. I can move pretty quickly in terms of like if I'm investing in the round – I can get a lot of other people to kind of go on the back of my diligence and follow. And then, you know, I try to try to pick people a year or two ahead of time before they meet the larger VCs and people know that I have good kind of organic relationships with them. And so that if they want to go on that path, you know, I'm not going to be an ax murderer. I'll be a decent thought partner on that path. So kind of a no harm person. I'm not sure what it is about your writing, but, something about your prose, you definitely come through on a personal level. It it feels like I know you, even though this is the first time we've actually spoken. Oh, I, I don't know how you pull it off. Um, well, I think like I got advice when I started the fund or before doing it. It was just like, there's this idea of like participatory journalism, which is you, you're, you're doing it, so just embed yourself in it. And rather than trying to tell people what you think or show off what you know, you just share what you see and observe, right? And that little 
switch, I think, makes it kind of educational. It's like edutainment for people, right? Sure. So uh, that's the show. Um, yeah, and so for me, it's just more like I don't. I sort of know what I'm doing, but I'm not an expert, so I'm not gonna. You know, the few things that I do feel expert on, I'm very quick to to put my foot down and be like, this is the absolute, this is how it is. But I only do that on a rare occasion. Generally, it's more like, hey, I don't know. But by the way, here's what I've observed. Um, so I think that, that that's the technique. It's, it's not that I sit there and I write out of a guide. It's more just how I think, right? So Yeah, it um, feels like a, a conversation. There's oh, a, hu- cool. you know, a well, humility thanks. there. It's, you're not talking at us. Well, when you get... When you want to invest in every single VC firm you talk to rejects you, you have no option but to be humble. <laughs> Love it. That will conclude this installment of Investor Stories. If you're enjoying the program and would like to see it continue, take a moment and leave a five-star review in iTunes. Also, if you'd like updates on new content from TFR, as well as the top 10 VC articles every week, go to fullratchet.net and sign up for the newsletter. Okay, that will wrap things up for today. Until next time, over-prepare, choose carefully, and invest confidently. Thanks for joining me.